You might already have a car collection, but do you have a racing car collection? If you've ever dreamed of the ultimate racing stable, there is a way. That's where Model Citizen Diecast comes in. They sell collector-grade scale model cars from manufacturers like Amalgam, AutoArt, Mini Champs, and others. So for your racing stable, how about the 1991 Le Mans winning Mazda 787B? or a Porsche 917 in martini livery, or a Lancia Stratos rally car. Model Citizen also carries iconic street machines, like Kyosho's super-detailed Toyota FJ60 Land Cruiser. It's a big model in 118th scale, with doors that open and wheels that steer. Just go to ModelCitizenDieCast.com and use the promo code HERITAGE at checkout for 10% off your order. Limitations apply. That's ModelCitizenDieCast.com. Model Citizen Diecast, because your inner child still wants to play with cars. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Horsepower Heritage. My name is Maurice Merrick, and thanks for listening out there in places like Warwick, Rhode Island, Atlanta, Georgia, Topeka, Kansas, Stanton, California, Wollongong, Australia, Maastricht in the Netherlands, and Stavanger, Norway. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and tell your friends about it. Well, if you're a sports car owner, you're going to enjoy today's episode because we're talking about Shelby Cobras. The Cobra is probably the most important American sports car in history because it was a winning, no-compromise design from the very start, and it dominated the Corvette in competition. Sorry to you Corvette fans out there. In 1952, Carroll Shelby was a struggling Texas chicken farmer when he began his amateur racing career. He was soon racing the Cadillac-powered Allard J2 all over the United States, and then he moved up to the Aston Martin DB3S, the Jaguar C-Type, and numerous other cars, including many Ferraris and Maseratis, culminating in his 1959 victory at Le Mans driving an Aston Martin DBR1. But because of his heart condition, which was a lifelong problem, Shelby retired from racing in 1960, and he took all the lessons he'd learned and put them into the Cobra. He made a deal with AC Cars in England to supply their tube frame, ace chassis, and aluminum bodywork. And then he got the Ford Motor Company to supply the 260 cubic inch V8, and of course later, the 289 and then the 427. Recently, I spoke with a couple of Shelby Cobra owners, and we talked about what makes these cars special for them. And their cars couldn't really be more different. First, there's Jim Barrett. Jim has owned his 1965 Shelby Cobra Mark II for 48 years. Now, his car is no beauty queen. It wears plenty of battle scars and the paint is lifting in some places, but it runs like a top and it oozes history, like your favorite old baseball cap or your grandpa's rifle. And during our drive up the Pacific Coast Highway, it was a beautiful Southern California day, and Jim showed me he enjoys every second behind the wheel. Afterward, we sat down in his backyard, and he told me the story of the car. We had a great time. You'll even hear the birds chirping and the wind chimes in the background. A few days later, I was on my way to meet the other Cobra owner, Mark Gardner. But a storm had rolled in that morning, and we weren't sure that we were going to be able to get any video of his Cobra, because it's pristine, and the weather was looking pretty lousy for photography. Luckily, by the time I arrived, the storm had cleared and Mark rolled the Cobra out of the garage. And then we sat down for the interview. But after about 20 minutes, we heard a loud whooshing sound and we realized it wasn't just raining again, it was hailing. And that's not good because the aluminum bodywork on a Cobra is only 60 thousandths of an inch thick, about double the thickness of a beer can. So we ripped off our microphones and ran outside to throw a cover on the car. Mark was a really good sport about the whole thing and no damage was done to his pride and joy, and it all worked out. But it struck me that the contrast in the weather that we had with these two interviews was as different as the cars we were talking about. Anyway, I'm going to cut a video version together for you too, and that should be available on the YouTube channel fairly soon, so check that out. So without further ado, I give you a tale of two cobras, right here on Horsepower Heritage. Let's hit it. all began in the Boy Scouts. That's the voice of Jim Barrett, a Southern California native who grew up in the golden age of American muscle. My Boy Scout Explorer Troop took a field trip to Shelby's factory at 6501 West Imperial Highway. And there I saw the Cobras and the Shelby Mustangs being put together. 
I actually saw the guy with the hole gun cutting the holes in the fenders of the Mustangs before they put the scoop on. And it made a big impression. It was classic Southern California hot rodders with some really, really great skills, Phil Remington mostly, and Ken Miles. Then I went to the Los Angeles Auto Show at the sports arena where the Shelby cars were just being introduced, and I got a handful of literature, which I still have. That was all it took. Jim had Shelby's on the brain. And it was simply obsession. Fast forward to where I was a punk 26-year-old with no business having to look for something like this. But as an avid, obsessive reader of Road and Track, saw the ad in the back of the issue in 73. The guy was asking $6,500. Jim called the seller and offered him six grand. He said yes. A couple of days later, after begging and borrowing lots of money, I flew up to Seattle, and this is where it gets kind of weird. Turns out the seller was kind of a bad dude. But recently he'd found Jesus, and he wanted to mend his wicked ways. And he had to testify to me in the car on the way to his house. Apparently selling the Cobra was part of his recovery. Started off by saying, you know, I've done a lot of bad things, but now I'm clean. And the guy gave Jim an idea of the treatment he would have gotten before his awakening. I probably would knock you on the head and take your money and leave you by the side of the road. And then he said, you know, I would have just taken your money and left you by the side of the road, which is an improvement. My head's not getting knocked on. Meanwhile, two other offers had come in the mail. A check for 7000 and a check for 7500 But the seller honored Jim's $6,000 offer on one condition. He made me promise to leave the Honk If You Love Jesus bumper sticker on the license plate. So the bumper sticker stayed, and Jim pointed his new Cobra in a southerly direction. But because the car had been in Seattle, it had the top up, really just ghastly. It's hot. If it rained, the windows steamed up. When I came across the Oregon-California border, with the top down, and it's never been up since. By 1973, most of Interstate 5 was completed, giving drivers a high-speed West Coast route from Canada to Mexico. And Jim took advantage of it on his way back to Southern California. It was amazing. I had never driven long distance at a high speed before. And if the speedometer was correct, slowing down to 100 miles an hour was just painful. I was going to get out and walk alongside or something. It absolutely exceeded my expectations, and um, it still scares me. But he got another little fright on that first drive. Near Bakersfield, I saw in the rearview mirror the red light come on on the CHP Cruiser, and I had checked the number of points on my driver's license. I could afford one moving violation. I pulled over the next lane. CHP officer nailed the Ford station wagon in front of me, and the bumper sticker had done its work. I said earlier that the first engine in the Cobra was the Ford 260. It was an early evolution of the Ford small block V8, which began production at just 221 cubic inches. The 260 was quickly superseded by the further bored out 289, and then there was the optional so-called Hypo, or High Performance 289K code engine, which is what Shelby began using for the Cobra. Here's a little history from Jim on Shelby serial numbers and early Cobra production. My car is basically a late Mark II, CSX2533. And that stands for Carroll Shelby Export. And 2533 was in the the last batch of 50 or so small block 289 Cobras built. The last one was 2588. The first models were also CSX cars that began with a two for the small block motor and then went from 2000, Shelby's prototype, to 2001, Bruce Meyer's first customer car. Those came with a 260 motor, worm and sector steering. After 2075, 75 models, they went to the 289 motor because Ford had phased out the 260, and the Mark II, which has rack and pinion steering vents on the sides, aka gills. With today's high dollar values, people forget that Cobras were all used cars at one point. But most of them went through plenty of changes during those early years. And Jim's is no exception. People say, well, your car is really stock. And it's really not. It started life white with a red interior. And the second owner in Seattle loaned it to his girlfriend. And some guy ran a stop sign and bumped the front fender. The owner of the car at the time said, well, what the heck? Let's change the color to that very, very dark green and black. And there's still some evidence of the red in the cockpit you can see. It's one thing to read about Shelby's in Road and Track, but it's another thing to own and drive one. With respect to its driving characteristic, absolutely exceeded what anything I could imagine. I had contemplated buying a Chevy-powered Austin Healey and drove it around for a couple of days, and it was pretty raggedy. 
And this was quite a bit different, being a lot lighter. Cobras are sort of notorious for getting away from an unsuspecting driver. And Jim was careful to learn how to drive the car properly. Yes, there was a learning curve. This is a high-performance car, 2,100 pounds, we'll say 350 horsepower. That's pretty drastic. It's a beast. The short wheelbase and the ability to overpower the rear tires means the car is prone to spinning. It's not any fun. If you lose it, you're out of control and bad things can happen. This car has never been raced. I've had it on the track a couple times at Willow Springs and didn't much care for that experience, but I did enjoy driving at Laguna Seca. But it has no roll bar. There's no protection. It's a aluminum foil wrapped around a frame, and it's a half century old. And owning this Anglo-American hybrid sports car presented some challenges. Do not use regular brake fluid. I managed to put the wrong stuff in. It blew out all the seals and the brakes and clutch and had to have it flushed and repaired. Look out for wet surfaces. Uh, I've found out the hard way enough times that the back end will come around and you can't compensate out of it very well. I have nothing but the highest regards for people who could drive these cars as race cars because it would be like sitting on a razor blade as far as I'm concerned. The Cobra was driven hard. Jim didn't race it, but he used it enthusiastically. And like any old car, it needed work from time to time, including being laid up for years at a stretch. Sometime in the 90s, uh, I had a rod knocking. And knowing it to be a very special motor, I didn't want to destroy it. So I parked it in the garage for a bunch of years. A guy was recommended to me that could do the rebuild in Fresno. I paid him some money. I put it back in myself. And just about then was the second or third Shelby day at the Peterson Museum. So drove it up there with my wife, had a lovely day. We were invited back to Lynn Park's place for a barbecue. On the way there, I lost a cylinder. And this motor maybe had 50 miles on it, and I knew that was not a good thing. So Lynn Park's son came with their pickup and towed me to the vent where we discovered that the push rods were all messed up. I pulled the heads, took a machine shop, and had them properly dialed in, put it back together, and it was okay. And I didn't put a lot of miles on that rebuilt motor. And then after a period of inactivity, a friend of mine freshened it up. And um, on the way back from his shop, not only did I lose two cylinders, I had a terrible metallic clanking, you know, doom. And it turned out the valves were hitting the pistons in two cylinders. That caused me to rebuild it again and do it right. My conclusion is this moron in Fresno simply took the motor to his local pet boys and had some trainees rebuild it. On the second rebuild, a wizard in Santa Ana was able to save the crankshaft, camshaft, lifters, rods, and pistons, the rods being the most rare. And it was he who said, upon disassembly, you know, your motor's been breathed on. Do you want me to put it back stock or leave it as breathed on? And that was kind of a no-brainer answer. So it's got something that was done to it before, plus the improvement to the heads, so that it really is a much better motor. And it puts out a lot of power. It does not like being driven between 2,500 and about 2,800. It starts to cough and kind of not be happy. But taking off about 3,500 to six grand easily is lots of scoot. It starts to get a little, run out a little steam about 7,000. And with the extra torque from the rebuild, there's no reason to run at that kind of revs. But I can tell you it makes pretty sounds at six grand. Jim never babied his Cobra, and over the decades, it's gotten a few bumps and bruises. The header on the passenger side had melted the gel coat in the fiberglass footwell to the point of melting the carpet inside as well. And he hasn't been fussy about fixing the cosmetics. The hood has a marvelous finish to it, caused the day before we left for Monterey when the carburetor backfired and caught fire. The paint at the top of the hood bubbled up and then collapsed, leaving a lot of cracks. Over the years, I've touched up those cracks with the rattle cam. There's a place on the right rear fender that's from backing up in my garage and being not very bright. And most notably, the highest form of foolishness has been trying to take down a ladder in my garage. And I lost control of it, and the ladder landed on the rear boot lid. I painted that too, but it's just one of those things. You know, if somebody was going to want to paint this, it would be a full restoration, take all the paint off, clean up the body, and put it back on. But that's not what I want to do. 
And in a world full of Tupperware Cobra kit cars, showing the car in public is always good for a few laughs when people try to decide if it's real or not. A person who has astounding amount of knowledge come over and rub his hands underneath the wheel wells and say, yep, it's a kit car, it's fiberglass. And then the perennial question is, when are you going to restore it? And my response is, it's a car meant to be driven. And in our society, especially among car freaks, sure, a beautiful car is fun, but I don't think people enjoy them as much. And I don't own this car to gain other people's admiration. I mean, I respect them and I appreciate it, but it's a car meant to be driven. So what's it like behind the wheel of a nearly 60-year-old Shelby Cobra, exposed to the elements with no roll-up windows, no insulation, a leaf-sprung ride, and that high-performance 289 V8 out in front of you? It's a very sensory experience. Today, on our drive up the Coast Highway, it's a beautiful spring day. I mean, how could you not enjoy what's going on? I like looking at the surf, and to me, cruising on Coast Highway is kind of a cliche, but it's it's a wonderful thing. Taking it all in is the only responsible thing to do because to be so fortunate to have this car and be its caretaker, I enjoy the sensory overload. We've gone camping in this car. I have no fear of taking it anywhere. And after watching Jim enjoy his car, I can tell you he doesn't waste a moment worrying about wear and tear or monetary value. If it was pristine or Concorde, I wouldn't even consider doing these things. So I guess I'm giving myself more latitude to enjoy it more, at least for what what does it for me. Now let's talk about the other car. Well, I always had the intention of, of buying a Cobra, but a lot of times they're so far out of reach for normal people. That's the voice of Mark Gardner. He chased a barn find Cobra for seven years and then spent another seven restoring it. This car was CSX 2022, which was the 22nd production car built, November of 1962. This car was built in the Shelby factory as an original race car for sale to the public. Racing has never been an inexpensive proposition, but compared to today, it's amazing that you could just walk into Shelby American and buy a turnkey race car for $5,995 or adjusted for inflation, $52,210.89. So if you were a privateer, you could go out and walk right into Shelby and buy yourself a race car, roll cage, racing belts, all of the pieces that were made for racing uh, were available to you in one package. And you could walk out and be ready to privateer or race the car. Very easy to do. And you could road register the cars. They were street legal. They came with, um, with MSO and, and Origin. Uh, you could take that to the DMV at the time. Remember that seat belts were optional. So uh, pretty much anything was street legal at that time. The first owner of Mark's car was a man named Greenstein, who had no intention of driving it on the street himself. This car was shipped directly to Hawaii in uh, racing trim. Uh, for the purpose of racing and was not was not subsequently uh, licensed for the street until the second owner. So the first owner, uh, Greenstein, he was only involved with racing the car. And in fact, Greenstein wasn't interested in being behind the wheel at all. Instead, he hired a driver. His name was Lloyd Sumaha. He was the only guy that drove the car in its first years. There was a track in Honolulu, which was called Kahuku. That track was basically a airstrip that was converted to a racetrack. Very rough, very crude, but that was all they had in, in Oahu, in the islands. So they raced that car for three years uh, on that track. And in 1963, they had the Hawaiian Grand Prix, which was a very prominent race for the Shelby team, they brought their team cars over to race in the Hawaiian Grand Prix. That became a very prominent race for the Shelby team in clocking in their wins in that 1963 race series. Um, They came from Riverside and from a couple of other races and won, of course. Greenstein had his fun with the car and sold it to the next owner, Bob Brown. He bought the car not needing it as a race car. He wanted to just have a streetcar to drive back and forth. He wanted a Cobra. It didn't matter. 
So he drove the car on the street back and forth to work. That was his daily driver car. In six months of driving that back and forth to work, one day he was driving, had an oil line crack on him. It caught a little fire in the cockpit. Uh, they put it out real quick, but it went into the garage. Bob Brown tried to repair it himself, but ended up cutting too much aluminum away, leaving a gap between the undamaged portion and the new fender. Now, here's a little background on repairing aluminum coachwork, just to give you an appreciation of the predicament Brown found himself in. First, underneath all that bodywork is a tube frame. All the coachwork on Cobras was hand-beaten over wooden bucks at AC Cars in England and then sent to Shelby in El Segundo. But there are always minor variations from one body to another, which need to be massaged whenever a portion is replaced. Secondly, TIG welding is the go-to method for welding aluminum alloy. In case you're not familiar with this process, it uses either helium or argon gas as a shielding agent to isolate the workpiece from the surrounding atmosphere, which would otherwise contaminate the weld. But aluminum melts at just over 1200 degrees Fahrenheit, so TIG welding requires a lot of skill, and it wasn't something that Bob Brown was capable of. Apparently, he couldn't find anyone else in Hawaii that could do the work either, so the car sat for decades until Mark found it. What followed was a seven-year effort to buy the car, and then another seven to restore it back in California. That project really helped Mark understand the genius of the original Shelby team. So with, with Phil Remington as a design engineering, uh, you saw that a little bit in the Ford versus Ferrari movie with the removable brake spindles. Um, I believe they were doing that all the way through. And with the Cobra, it was very interesting because they were trying to take a chassis that was a little bit antiquated with the transverse leaf spring front and needing to convert that to rack and pinion. Steering was, was the very first thing that they did to try to get a little more race oriented. Um, other than that, there weren't a lot of problems with the car. The Salisbury diff, which was um, an independent diff, gave a very nice control in the rear. And with the addition of sway bars front and rear, uh, that gave them a very maneuverable car. Again, lightweight, the 1900 pounds, made it real light in the rear end. So it was really, you were able to drive the car, throttle steer the car properly, and the rear end would kick around at will. Uh, especially when you were using a wider tire in the rear, uh, almost no weight in the rear. That made it a very interesting drive. He'd always had his sights set on a competition example. Race cars, I, I always loved the race cars as opposed to the street car. It's a whole different category. Mark's car is bright red with white roundels that carry the number 22 in reference to the car's serial number, CSX2022. The race cars, even at that time, were so far out of reach that I would not have really purchased one. After a painstaking restoration effort, Mark planned to show the car publicly for the first time at the Monterey Historics in 2012. But it turned out to be a bittersweet occasion because... That was the 50th anniversary of the Cobra. And in May, Carol Shelby passed. And so it started as the Cobra... 50th birthday, and then became the Carroll Shelby Memorial. So everyone recognized the need to bring all of the cars in, and everyone come in and pay tribute to him at the time. And it was the very first showing of this car. So when I brought the car to Monterey, we were mobbed. The people that love Cobras, that was kind of the epitome of having a gathering, having all those cars together, and having the people together that really love that car. A lot of the people that have these cars were, are, are very interesting in the fact that they've, uh, several have owned the cars since new and have raced the cars since new, Lynn Park and some of the others, that these cars are tools for them to go racing. They're not, they don't look at values, they don't look at different things like that. They look at as a pure sports car and to this day, ready for the track. Mark figures that Carroll Shelby and his guys got it right from the very start. There's nothing like a group of Cobras going down the corkscrew at Laguna Seca. The roaring of that, there's nothing like it. When I was standing in the pits with Vic Edelbrock, he said to me, I still get chicken skin on my arm every time I hear that. It never gets old. 
My thanks to Jim Barrett and Mark Gardner for sharing the stories of their cars and the passion they have for them. That's all for this episode of Horsepower Heritage. If you like what you've heard, don't forget to subscribe and leave me a five-star review. Until next time, I'm Maurice Merrick. Thanks for listening.